Good evening and thanks for coming. My name is Joel Allen. I'm a professor of religion here at Dakota Wesleyan and the director of the McGovern Center. And I want to welcome you to the Stark Lectureship this year uh, and just kind of give you a little bit of a background on the Stark Lectureship. Uh, this, this is the 61st year of the Stark Lectureship. I mean, how many, that, that's, you know, a long record of consistency. It was started in 1959 by Franklin Stark, who is a 1937 graduate of Dakota Wesleyan. And the mission statement of the Stark Lectureship is to present publicly persons who are living examples of the truths of the Christian gospel and who demonstrate by the authenticity of their own lives the connection today between faith and works. So the, word, the lectureship is interested in kind of exploring the connection between a person's faith and the way that faith works its way out in the world to seek justice and to make the world more compassionate and filled with God's presence. And so I'm very excited that we are able to bring to, to us today, bring to campus today, uh, Reverend Doctor, recently Doctor, I guess, uh, Sean Moore. Some previous uh, Stark lectures, theologian Elton Trueblood, uh, Be Bishop Desmond Tutu's daughter, Naomi Tutu, uh, Senator Mark Hatfield, uh, columnist Cal Thomas, and the author of the very famous book, Blue Light Jazz, Donald Miller. So for 60 years, the Stark Lectureship has brought together authors and activists, philosophers and genocide survivors, and most recently, in fact, it was just days before the pandemic broke out, Sarah Calhoun came from White Sulphur Springs, Montana, which is my wife's hometown. And she was the founder of the Red Ants Pants Music Festival. If you know the music scene in Montana, you've heard of the Red Ants Pants Music Festival. It draws thousands of people into this very small town of White Sulphur Springs. And she also started a uh, foundation called the Red Ants Pants Foundation. So this year, Sean Moore is the man of the hour. And we've been uh, thinking about addressing for some time the issues and the challenges of racial divides in our country, and several names were floated and discussed, but I'm very glad that we've settled on Sean and uh, have him here on our campus. So as we are all aware, after the, uh, the terrible uh, killing of, of George Floyd last summer and other uh, terrible events similar to it, that the world broke apart, not only in our country, but all over the world, with great uh, anxiety and frustration over some of these issues. And I don't know why I was surprised by the level of, of dismay and the millions of people in the streets, literally millions of people, but uh, I don't know why I was surprised. We shouldn't have been, but uh, there were cry people crying out for a better world. But beyond any statistics related to that and policy questions related to that, there's a deeper question that Sean is going to explore with us. And it's like, how do we have conversations about race that really produce something, that really produce compassion, that really build wholeness into our culture and society? What policies and practices could possibly engender less disparity, more inclusion, more opportunity for people of all races? And what, how can we care for each other in a way that helps and that is actually helpful and not just emotionally satisfying? Sean stands at the very middle of these circling, swirling questions. Sean is a pastor and activist. He's a certified life coach. He's a former policeman and former military officer, but also a present, is presently a police bias trainer. Sean has uh, com recently completed a de doctor of ministry degree in racial reconstruction, uh, re reconciliation, I should say, racial reconciliation. And uh, he studied the reconciliation movement in South Africa. Sean presently teaches reconciliation studies at Bethel Seminary and uh, also teaches at Metro State. So I also want to mention, if you're watching on YouTube live, uh, you can, uh, we'll be monitoring that. And if you have questions at the end, Sean will speak for 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have Q&A. And if you uh, send in a question over chat, we will uh, be able to uh, uh, communicate those to Sean. So uh, why don't you welcome, help me, Welcome, Sean Moore, to the Dakota Wesleyan University family. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thanks to the folks upstairs. Thank you. Uh, so, man, uh, hearing the introduction of those that have come before me for the stock lecture, uh, pretty humbling. I'm, I'm, I'm following in some big footsteps here. So, number one, I appreciate uh, you inviting me and me being here. Uh, but before I start, it's important that I'd like to take a pause uh, uh, to recognize folks that uh, might have said something that don't actually have a voice. And so I, I want to pause for a second uh, as it relates to those who are indigenous and Native American folks uh, who are the original caregivers of the land that I'm actually standing on that I do not own. Uh, so I say, Sabona, I see you. Uh, I'd like to also take a moment to pause for the uptick in violence against uh, Asian individuals in our country, in particular uh, the six women that were shot and killed over the last couple of days, I pause. And also to the LGBTQIA community uh, as it relates to BIPOC trans women, uh, no matter what your theological slant or your political ideology is, to create harm emotionally or physically uh, is not appropriate, so I take pause. All right, so uh, I have this personal mission statement. So one of the things that, I'm gonna start moving around now, right? So one of the things that I hold dear to myself is that I have a, a personal mission statement. So you might have a company with a mission statement, but I have my own personal mission statement. And my mission statement is, to seek out greatness while being a living contribution. That's my mission. Every morning I wake up and I say, how can I seek out greatness while being a living contribution? And I have then these, this, this core phrase, which is called great. I want to be great. I want to be great at everything that I want to attempt to try, and I want you to also be great. Now, when I use the word great, it is an acronym and the G stands for gratitude. So every morning I wake up and I try to have some sort of a gratitude, like thank you for my home, or thank you for my wife and my kids, thank you for the food, but I need to have gratitude. My R, of course, is my passion, which is reconciliation, right? So I'm always asking how can I be a reconciler uh, every moment that I'm living my life. E is for excellence. I choose to be excellent all the time. Now, I'm shooting for these things. It doesn't mean that I'm, I'm always getting there, but I wake up in the morning and I have goals, right? I have, I have a goal, right? Uh, the A stands for adaptation, right? I'm constantly trying to adapt to my new environment. And the T stands for teach, train, or technique. So every day I wake up, how do I, how do I, uh, how do I improve in gratitude? How do I become a better reconciler? How do I engage in excellence? How do I adapt? And then what am I learning or training or teaching consistently? Now, I'm not saying that I'm always reaching 100% at those things, but then I've got goals every day. Every morning I wake up and I have these goals, and at night I can say, here's what I've done with these goals. So I take in particular Proverbs 18, 16, literally when it says, a person's gifts will open doors for you. I believe that I have a gift that I want to share with you, right? And so I want you to be able to engage in this model that I've looked at and I've created over some time, and it's a gift that I'm giving to you. So I want to start out with the word apokatastasis, and that's the word that I use for reconciliation. It is, a, it is the understanding that reconciliation is at its highest purest form. It is reconciliation of the mind, the body, and the spirit. So when I talk about reconciliation, I'm talking about a whole, a holistic understanding of what it means to engage in someone else. It is a final restoration of all things. Uh, it is a state of favor and protection. So I have this model that I've been working on for a while I want to share with you. But before I can share the model with you, I need to kind of share with you some of the, 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 the problems that take place with reconciliation because if you're not careful, you can fall into these, these problematic issues. The first one is, 
How do you move from theory to action? How do you actually get it done? What are you actually doing when you say, hey, I, we've had this issue and I want to be reconciled with you? What are we actually trying to say? Well, this model will actually address the issue of how do you move from theory to application. Uh, there's also the understanding that reconciliation tends to lack injustice, right? Reconciliation doesn't mean let's have diversity club, let's have cross-cultural engagements. Reconciliation is redirecting or aligning one's heart, mind, and spirit to do what's right. Now, those byproducts of diversity will be secondhand. Those will naturally flow once my mind and heart are in aligned. Is it okay for me to say amen? I can say that, I can say amen? Okay. Amen? amen? All right. I didn't know if I was allowed to say that here or not. Okay. The other issue that, we're, that we have is how do you actually measure reconciliation? Like, how do you actually measure reconciliation? If you say, me and you, we're not getting along and I want to be reconciled with you, how do you know when you're done? At what point have you done something to where you can actually measure this and the last thing, unfortunately, is a Eurocentric driven understanding of Christianity. Hey, this becomes very problematic as it relates to anyone who comes out of a different cultural norm. Make sense? And so we have this understanding of what does it mean to move from theory to action? What does it mean to engage in justice? How do you measure it? And then how do you move out of a Eurocentric male driven Christianity? Because there are more than just Eurocentric males who are Christian. There we go. Yeah, there we go. It's kind of this common response, right? And so how do we move beyond these things? And I believe my model addresses all of these. So reconciliation is this process, right? It is a practice of love, care, and compassion. And when I use the word praxis, I mean, number one, there's an action a reflection, and a theory. And so for me, in my model, it is an action-driven uh, phenomenon, right? So we're not going to talk about sitting in the classroom and going through books and going through uh, theories. We're literally going to jump right in. We're going to jump right in, then we're going to do some things, then we're going to reflect on what we did, and then out of that reflection comes the theory, right? And so this is action-oriented training. It's action-oriented reconciliation. It's the idea of getting out and doing something, and it, it works, then guess what? We're going to do it again. If it fails, guess what? We're not going to do that anymore, right, because it, it failed. Or we might try it in another context, but it's this idea of we are consistently doing things and then getting the theory out of it, which is a little different. Here in the West, we like to have our theories sound, and then we want to apply them. It is a praxis of justice. It is a praxis of community building. It is a praxis of establishing an authentic relationship with someone. Authentic relationships. I like to call authentic relationships kind of like it's ranch dressing. It's real. It's not fat free. It's not turkey bacon. It's real bacon. And if you're going to have bacon, you might as well have real bacon. There, amen. Yes, indeed. If you're going to have bacon, you might as well have real bacon, not turkey bacon. But these are all the things that it takes, right? So, so we move past this. We were talking about it's the art of removing barriers that hinder authentic relationships. Reconciliation or apocatastasis is the ability to remove barriers that hinder authentic relationships. If it gets in the way of something that's authentic, it needs to be. Removed. That's simple. We need to remove it. And to do so, we need to share stories. So if you're going to engage in reconciliation with someone and you're not sharing stories, you're not doing reconciliation. There needs to be a story, not one that's fake, a real story based upon what's actually going on in real time. And I got to tell you, as someone who does a lot of work in the community, with law enforcement in the church, we are doing a lot of talking and very little action and listening. We're not listening. We're not listening to each other. We're, we're doing a lot, of, a lot of talking, but we're not doing a lot of listening. 
So one of the things that I recognize as a, as a trainer is that I will go into a police department and I'll say, let's talk, let's have a conversation. And then they'll literally ask me all these questions and I'll try to answer them. And then I'll go into a community setting and say, let's have a conversation. And they're going to ask me the same questions that, that, that the law enforcement ask. My question is, why can't we get those community members and those law enforcement officials in the same room? You, and then I, I would have no problem facilitating, f- facilitating that conversation. But as long as you are talking to me, you're not addressing the issue because the issue rests where? In the community, out where folks are at. Right? And so we need to have better listening skills as we're telling stories. There needs to be a lament. A lament is a physical manifestation of a crying out. There needs to be this crying out And it needs to find itself in the form of a a monument or a flag or a covenant. But once I say, here's what's happened to me, and I'm not happy about it, it needs to be expressed some way in a monument or or a song. Or we need to set aside a time where we're like, we recognize what we've done is wrong, and we're going to do this thing. right? You first need to address what the wrong is on everyone's part. This is also a hard thing. It's hard to admit that you've been wrong or that you've been following the rules and you've been wrong or you're engaging in this process and you've been wrong. And when I say you've been wrong, I'm not talking about those who have authority and those that don't. I'm talking about we are all complacent and we all have dirty hands. You can wipe your hands off all you want to, but you're going to find dirt on your hands. Amen? Amen. Then there's forgiveness. We have to be able to forgive. Forgiveness does not mean it's a good feeling, right? To forgive doesn't mean, oh, I'm going to feel so good. Forgiveness isn't the same as trusting. It's not the same as uh, healing. It's definitely not forgetting, and it's not condoning. Forgiveness is this ability to let other folks go. I, I can't hang on to this anymore. I, again, and as, and as for followers of Jesus, we recognize that we are told to forgive. But it's not easy to forgive. I've been a clergy person now for 10 years. I've been in law enforcement for uh, 10. Uh, I've done all types of things, and I still struggle with forgiving. It's a struggle for me. And, and, and maybe I'm the only one here who it's a problem for. Maybe all of you out there and all of you on internet land have no problem whatsoever with forgiveness, but I struggle with it. Right? It's a real struggle for me. Amen? We need to have accountability. We need to be held accountable to cause no more harm. We need to be able to write covenants. Right? I need to recognize what I've done is not okay. Because here's the deal. If no, it's very difficult to forgive. It is almost outlandishly difficult to forgive when someone says, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did this to you. Because I'm sorry doesn't cut it. I'm sorry isn't going to cut the trauma that I've experienced. I'm sorry is not going to cut the, the, the therapy that I'm going to have to go through. I'm sorry isn't going to cut it. And this is the reason why we have to be able to forgive. But for those that are literally saying, I want to do something different, you need to first recognize what your behavior has done to the other individual, what my behavior has done to you. Then you need to recognize what you've been able, what what you've done. And then after you've been able to recognize what you've done, you need to make an amends, which means I recognize it and I'm not going to do it anymore. And if I do, here's what's going to happen. What's easier to do, to say sorry or make an amends? It's easy to say sorry. It's easy to say, I'm sorry. To make an amends, I, I got to take an active responsibility. See, when you say, I'm sorry, you're just putting the weight on someone. You're putting the weight back on to someone. An amends is, I need to take all the weight. And then you have to ask, what can I do to make it better? Then there's restoration and reparations. Uh-oh. I, you, I hear some laughing. Reparations? What is that supposed to mean? Because basically when you hear that word, what comes to mind? Be honest. Money or my money, right? My money comes to mind, right? It isn't just money. It's 
my money. It's my house. It's my backyard. You want my stuff, right? That's what we tend to think about reparations. And that's not what reparations is. Reparations is this phenomena of it might mean something tangible like money, but it means recognizing and then putting something in place to take care of what was done. And now, reparations will look different for every community. For some communities, it might, be, it might mean money. For others, it might mean education. It might mean something else. But again, there's no such thing as saying, I'm sorry for what I've done, and then just saying, go about your business. Let's just get along to go along. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Does that make sense? So every community needs to deal with these issues of storytelling, lamenting, forgiveness, accountability, and reparations. Then there's justice. The word I use here is mishpet, and it means this, this, it's, it's this, this moving the scales to where they're going to be evened out. Amos, the prophet Amos, he says, God says, I don't want to have your worship. I want justice. I want it to flow like a river. I want it to continue to, I want it to roll out. Man, forget that. I want to have justice. Now, if we're able to do storytelling, lamenting, forgiveness, accountability, restoration, and justice, we find ourselves moving through these 12 principles, right? There are these 12 principles that I want to talk about. These 12 principles include acceptance, hope, faith, courage, honesty, patience, humility, willingness, brotherly love, integrity, self-discipline, and service. Sound like a good thing? That sounds like a good, I think that sounds good to me. Yeah? Sound good to you? Yeah, it sounds good. If we can, if we are able to fully engage in these 12, these 12 practices, these will literally begin to show fruit in these areas. Love, joy, peace, endurance, goodwill, being principled, devoted, and self-control. If you're not sure what that list was, we call them fruits of the Spirit in this thing called the Bible. Amen. 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 Right? So, again, by accepting, by acceptance, hope, faith, courage, honesty, patience, humility, willingness, brotherly love, integrity, self-discipline, and service, we begin to grow with love, joy, peace, endurance, goodwill, being principled, being devoted, and self-control. I also... I, uh, like Joel said, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a certified coach. And so when I do reconciliation, we're talking about coaching people. So you, you can't tell someone to be reconciled. If you do, you're not doing reconciliation. You're doing conflict management, and that's fine. Uh, but conflict management and conflict resolution is not the same as reconciliation. Conflict resolution and conflict management are issues of behavior. I'm going to constrict your behavior. You will do this or I will fire you. That's what conflict management is. You're going to go to HR. Now, reconciliation is this understanding of redirecting one's soul, one's spirit, one's compassion to see someone in a different light, right? Because you can have conflict resolution and conflict management and behave yourself in the workplace and still hope the worst for that person. That person was a trip down the stairs and fall and break their leg. I, I would just... Turn the other way. Compared to having a true emotional bond with someone else. When I was a kid, I'm, I'm going to age myself. I'm, this is not the new movie. But when I was a kid, there's this movie called Dune. It's now going to be a remake. But they had these people with these heart plugs. And if you pull out the heart plug, they literally kind of bleed out, right? Kind of gross. Uh, but I think that if my heart plug was connected to Joel's heart plug, Joel wouldn't get very far without me being there consistently. Because if he pulled too hard, what would happen? My heart plug would come out. If I pulled too hard on him, his heart plug would come out. So literally, we need to work on connecting our heartstrings together. Right? We, we, I, I think if, if my heartstrings are together, I, I, I can't see you starve. I can't do awful things to you if I see you as my brother and my sister because our heartstrings are attached. Make sense? 
So my model is quite simply, we want to build community. We want to co-create through discovery. We want to use praxis and code writing. And number four, we want to have mastery. So hopefully you've been writing questions down uh, because I, I, I'm looking forward to getting to the Q&A part of the presentation. But step one in my model for reconciliation is number one, Sabona. It's a word that I learned when I was in South Africa. It means hello. But a deeper meaning, it means I see you. So the first step in reconciliation is Sabona, which means I need to see you. I need to see you emotionally. I need to see you financially. I need to see you physically, mentally. I need to see you completely because if I can truly see you, then how can I avoid you? If I can see you, like I, I don't see you. It's easy to walk around and say, I don't see you. But once I completely see you, it's hard for me to be in your company and not be like, hi. It's, it's difficult for me to do so. So I, first of all, I need to see you. The other term that I like to use that I learned there is the word Ubuntu, which means I am because we are. It's a way of saying community. Number one, if I can see you, then you are a part of my community. I need to treat you as such, like you are part of my community. Then again, there's mishpat, which means there's justice. Now again, for this part, I need to make some admissions. Number one, I need to admit that I am powerless, and I need to, number two, I need to find hope. Number one, if I could do it on my own, I would what? I would do it, but I am powerless to do anything else but what I've been doing. So I need help, yes, amen? So I need some help. And number two, I need to find hope. So when we're talking about how to get this done, we're talking about meeting in circles. Right? We're talking about doing social justice circles. We're talking about looking at restorative justice practices. Uh, we're telling stories. And I think you should form a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Right? If you're going to talk about doing reconciliation, you need to form some sort of a board that will be able to hold you accountable. Who should be on the board? That's kind of a question. I, I, I kind of I like an answer. From someone in the crowd. I can't, you can't answer me on, in the internet. Who should be on the team? The truth and reconciliation. Who should be on the team? Who do you think should be on the team? I'll give you a hint. The people involved in the conflict should be on the team. That's who should be on the team. You should have representatives on that particular team, right? It should be from both sides. Both groups should be there. And number, that's the first thing. Both groups should be there. And this group needs to have power and authority. There's nothing worse than being told, here's the group that's got power and authority. Then you start making decisions and something like, well, we need to talk to this person. We need to talk to this person. And we need to get approval for this. Like, well, then that person should be where? should be in the group. So if your organization is going through a reconciliation issue and there needs to be someone who can make that decision, they need to be on that. So the president needs to be there. The police chief needs to be there. Uh, the doctor needs to be there. Whoever needs to make the decision needs to be there so you don't got to go find the answer to someone else. Right? And so the truth and reconciliation team is a group of individuals who have power and authority and can make those decisions. Make sense? Step two, co-creation. What could it look like to be in an authentic relationship with someone who's your enemy? What could that look like? That's kind of hard, right? What could it look like to be in an authentic relationship with someone who is your enemy? I've literally, I've seen reconciliation take place between uh, the mothers of victims and how uh, another young person has shot and killed uh, a, a young man. And the mother and the shooter came together and she was able to forgive him, right? And so you think, oh, the, I, what happened? My son was shot by this person. I'm going to forgive them. You must be on drugs. I'm not forgiving anyone who shot. But again, I've seen reconciliation take place between gang members. I've seen reconciliation take place between mothers and the, uh, the attackers of their sons. I've seen reconciliation take place in amazing ways. But you need to start asking yourself, what would it look like 
to be in an authentic relationship with someone who I do not like. Because if we're told to love our enemies, then what does that mean? We, we have to love our enemies. Those that we don't get along with. It's important that we are able to do so. It's the both and, which is very difficult. Because if I had my way, the whole entire world would be the way I'd want it to be. Everyone would prefer Batman over Superman. Everyone would like chocolate cake, right, without mint. I didn't say nothing for dinner, but we had chocolate cake with mint. I didn't eat mine. I had what I just would prefer not that. But if the whole entire world was like the way I would want it to be, it would be shaped to fit my liking. What a boring place that would be, huh? But it's not either or, it's both in. And here's the part that I think makes uh, my model unique. If you're not actually working towards what a authentic relationship could look like with someone you're not getting along with, then you're not actually doing reconciliation. Does that make sense? So the question is, who do I need to become to make it happen? Who do I need to become to make this happen? And here's the part where I need to surrender to a greater spiritual power. Right, so step three in this model, uh, my second step is, number one, I need to surrender to a greater spiritual power. Because I've got way too much pride to bow down to someone who's wronged me. And I've got too much pride to say I'm sorry for something I've done, or I don't believe that I've done. I don't believe I should say sorry, so why should I say sorry? How's that, how's, that, how's that sit on you? We want you to say sorry for something you didn't do. How many hands? Put them up that you think that's an okay thing. And that feels good. If, for those that are on internet land, there's not a hand that's raised in this auditorium. Uh, and it makes complete sense. But the question is, what did Christ do? Because Christ would put his hand up for each and every one of us, Yes. You're going to go to cross with that person? I will. See, following Christ means doing the things that Christ would do. And that's a difficult task, especially when it comes to real-life situations of reconciliation. Amen. There we go. Step three is this writing out the best practices in covenant writing. So step one, right, so I'm building community through uh, Ubuntu and Sabona, and we're doing justice work, right? We're trying to figure out what it means to remove these barriers. <coughs> Step two, we're actually doing the both and. Like, what does it mean to be in an authentic relationship with you? Step three is now that I got it figured out, I have to do what? I have to write it out. I have to write out these covenants. I have to write them out. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what you're going to do. And if I end up breaking this thing, then here's what we're going to do. Here, I need to start making an inventory and show my inventory with people that uh, I trust. So again, I'm taking an inventory, and this is like a spiritual audit. It's like every spring, like churches go through their spring cleaning. They go through their garages, and they, they go through everything. They clean up everything. You need to do a spring spiritual audit on yourself. What are the things that makes it difficult for me to want to be your friend on my end? What are the things that I need to actually change and you're just doing a spiritual cleaning. You're asking yourself, what are the things that I need to do? You're making this list, and then I want you to share it with someone. That's a difficult thing to do, right? To make a list of all the things in which you are uh, failing at, you're not good at, and then you need to share it with someone else. Now, I'm not telling you to go share this with anyone. You need to share it with someone that you trust, that cares for you. But when you do your spiritual audit, you are going through and saying, these are the things that might make it difficult for someone to want to be in my company. It might be difficult to be in Sean's company when he always wants to talk or he always wants to be in control or he always wants to have a say. I need to be honest with those things because those are the things that do what? Those create natural barriers between me and someone else. And if I'm going to be reconciled with someone else, I need to do what? Remove the barriers that hinder authentic relationships. 
being a Christian is absolutely the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole entire life. I've done three triathlons. I've done three marathons. Uh, and those were outlandishly difficult. Uh, but nothing is more difficult than admitting you're wrong, seeking out the right way to do so, and asking for forgiveness. There's nothing more difficult than that. And maybe just because I struggle with the issues that I struggle with, and maybe it's much easier for you to do so. But claiming to be a Christian and then doing that same thing, or not the same thing, they're not the same, right? We say, we, we say this is a Christian nation. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would challenge that. Then I'm not saying there aren't Christians in this country, but if this is a Christian nation, then our form of Christianity is wackadoo. That's the scientific understanding, wackadoo. They need to be ready for change. How many of you are like actually ready for change? Like you're, you're, you're like here. Here's my inventory, and I, I want to change. I'm I'm looking forward to change. I'm anticipating changing. Then you need to ask the higher power, please help me change. Then you need to make a list of amends because once you've gone through your closet. And you figure out all those, the, all those, those bones and everything else that's in there. You then need to make an amends. List them all out. I need to go talk to my dad about this issue. I need to talk to uh, my ex-girlfriend about this issue. I need to talk to my ex-boyfriend about this issue. I need to talk to my father-in-law. You, you need to go through and you need to make these amends and write down who you need to go talk to. Like who do you need to talk to? And then you need to do this. You need to hey number one. Back two years ago when I said these things, I was lying to you. I wasn't being completely honest. I was lying, and I want to make it better. I recognize that lying doesn't improve anything in my life, and it makes you have a false sense of who I am. What can I do to change that? Now, it's outlandishly difficult to make an amends with someone once you've done that. It's, it's outlandishly difficult to be like, I'm in the wrong. I recognize I'm in the wrong. How do I fix it? It's by, far, it's by far easier to say what? Sorry. I'm sorry. And then do it again and again and again and again and again. It might include therapy, right? You might need to go through therapy or coaching, right? The way I, I distinguish between coaching, coaching is taking an issue and moving it forward, uh, and therapy might mean dealing with the past and how that got started. There, there are two different forms, and you might need therapy or coaching or both. Then there's step four, and step four is masters, where you start living out this stuff, right? You start living it out. You actually do what you are going to say. Now, one of the things I talked about early on was the understanding of how do you measure reconciliation, and here's how you measure reconciliation with my model. And step two, when you're doing co-creation, you're like, we want to be about these things. Well, in step four, you're actually going to do them. So if you say a part of being reconciled in this community is that we close the achievement gap by 14 points, you can literally begin to start doing things that actually close the achievement gap. If you say we are going to make sure that uh, we're going to reduce our homeless population by 4%, you can, then start, you can then start creating programs to take care of what you said you were going to do in step two, right? You can then literally start to do the things that you say you're going to do because reconciliation is truly about doing something which moves you way beyond the theory of the thing. Does that make sense? You actually have to do something in reconciliation. And again, most of the writers who are writing about reconciliation can tell you about the theology of it. They'll tell you about the word apokatastasis. They'll talk to you about where you can find the word at in the Bible. They'll share with you how the Bible references uh, actually work and how you can do hermeneutics and how that applies to one's life. But then you start asking, 
What are you going to actually do? Like, if you're a reconciler, what does that actually mean? What are you going to produce? And you get, uh, or beep. You have to actually do something, right? If you are literally an ambassador for, for, for reconciliation, well, then the old is gone, the new has come, right? The old is gone, the new has come. Well, th this transition means that you are actually doing something. You have to actually do something. Which was the biggest thing that I learned when I went to South Africa. I had studied reconciliation in the States through a westernized lens, and then when I went to South Africa, there was very little theory talking. Everyone was just, they were just doing, acting, acting, acting. Right? There was this action research. Like, here's the action. From the action, we're going to reflect on the action. Here comes the theory. Then we're going to apply the theory to the new action. Then we're going to do some reflection. That reflection leads to a theory and then leads to the third action. They were actually doing things. So when I came back, I said, I want to, I, I, I want to plant a church based upon that kind of model of we do, we reflect, we have a theory, then we do it again. Here, we make the admissions of, we need to make an amends, yes. We need to continue our inventory, so it isn't a one-time thing, to where you figure out what's going on. You are consistently cleaning out the closet. Then we want to make an improvement on our conscious contact with that greater power, and we want to help others. There are three questions that you're going to ask yourself in step four. Number one, did we reach our goals? Did we say, did we do what we say we're going to do? If the answer is yes, then you can say what? Help me out here. If, if you started out by saying, in step two, to do reconciliation means we're going to do this, and then in step four you're doing that, that means you are literally, say it again, you're literally doing reconciliation. The answer is right there in front of you. So when you say, what does it mean to do reconciliation? Well, in step two, we said, we're going to close the gap. We're going to give more of this. We're going to love more. We're going we're to actually do this thing. When you get to step four and you're actually doing it, you can then say, what? I'm literally reconciling here and now. Again, I've addressed the issue of the justice issue. Yes, have I not? I've addressed the issue of how do you move from theory to action? I've addressed the issue that it's both in its co-creation. So if, 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 if it's uh, a group of black individuals and a group of white individuals, it becomes, it becomes Eurocentric and Afrocentric. I've addressed the issue of it just being Eurocentric dominant. See, these are the issues that continue to take place in reconciliation. And one of the questions that I'm always faced with as it relates to folks of color uh, is always, why would I want to be reconciled with someone who doesn't want to be reconciled with me? Or... When was the last time we were reconciled? At what point in the history of America have black people been reconciled with white people? Because slavery starts uh, the year 1619, doesn't end until 1865, and then we've got uh, civil rights in 1964, but when have we ever had it correct? I always answer the same way. It isn't about that. It's about being reconciled to something greater than yourself. Because at what point has any human tribe, culture, or group been reconciled with someone else? We have to go back to something greater than ourselves. Amen? After we ask the question, how have we changed? If you're, if you're doing reconciliation and you do the 12 steps, you're literally growing. Right? You're literally growing spiritually in yourself. And then the last part is, how did I change? I am a reconciler. I am doing what I said I'm going to do. And then you go back to step one. You go back to step one, and then step two, and then step three, and then step four. Then what do you do? Go back to step one, then step two, then step three, then step four. Then what do you do? 
There it is. This is the process of reconciliation. Number one, build community. Number two, co-create. Number three, write it down. Number four, become a master of what you said you're going to do. Then do what? Step one over again. Over and over and over and over and over until you are what? Till you're reconciled. Until I have an authentic relationship with you. It's not easy. It's difficult. It's challenging. But once you have an authentic relationship with someone, you have now gained a new brother, a new sister. You've gained a great deal of new skills. You've been introduced to someone else's three F's. Maybe you know what the three F's are? Food, fabric, and festival. Right? I've been introduced to some new foods, some new fabric, some new festivals. And if you're able to engage in those three, then you get the pH, the philosophies behind those things. Make sense? You can actually measure reconciliation. You can actually measure spiritual engagement if you attach it to something else. I believe my model does so. Uh, and again, it's, 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 it's for you. It, it isn't for me. It's for all of us, right? Uh, scripture says that we are ambassadors for reconciliation. I just decided that I was tired of it being way too foggy, way too theoretical, and I decided to do something about it. So I wrote this big head paper. Then I defended it, and they said, okay, yeah, we agree. And, and now I'm giving it out to you for free. Why? Because your gifts will make room for you, and I'm here to share it with you. There it is, amen. So at this point, I'd like to take some questions. It's 7, 750, and do you have any questions? Or do we, so we start with those that are online. Are, they, are there any questions that are online? Nope, okay, how about in here? It's exactly what it is. So if you have the mind to actually do what I'm saying, if your your idea is so good to get in box and mind uh as support, love, um not support as people are pointed by of course to the Hebrew garden where they were wondering and they had this little like That's a great question. Uh, again, so I, I recognize that when I wrote my dissertation that if I just let it be there, that it would literally sit on the bookshelf in United Seminary. It would, it would just sit there. Uh, and I also recognize if I decided to put it into a book, it would sit on someone's bookshelf. That was it. Great papers become great books. Great books become bookshelf things. Uh, so I literally created, I've literally created a, a non-profit business called the Center for, Ra for Racial Reconciliation. And this is a center that literally does, it, it does teachings and trainings on the four steps. Uh, it is a non-profit. Literally, I've just, I mean, we just got the paperwork back stating that we were now this non-profit. It's based upon my research. Uh, and literally, we have four classes, we've got workshops, uh, but basically it's the idea of how do you build community, how do you do co-creation, how do you create truth and reconciliation commissions, then how do you actually do it, and we're doing this in real time, right, because I think one of the issues that I struggle with is what if you can't afford to have a reconciliation kind of an education? So what I've decided was the reason why it's a nonprofit is because we will then pay the professors what they would normally get paid and not put it on the students who are engaging in the process of reconciliation. So I literally, I just created, I mean, literally, I just, what is today? Today's Thursday. Last week we got the paperwork from the state saying, yay, you're a nonprofit now. So we've got this company that we have set up to do just that because I'm about action and not about just theory. Great question. Anyone else? Yes, in the back. Uh, 
at you. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So people in the mic can hear it. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry. Sorry to the folks that are online. I, I apologize. Gotcha. Yes, so I think that's a great question. Number one, the, 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 the team on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission would then set the time limit. But again, here's the beauty of reconciliation. When you're going through Sabona, Ubuntu, and this justice work, when you're not ready to move, then guess what? You don't move, right? And so it's, there's no real time limit, right? I mean, you might find yourself being frustrated, but again, it's the group that gets to decide what it means to engage with each other. So it might take two weeks, two years, 20 years. It might be legacy of work. Are you kidding me? Legacy work? Are you out of your... Yeah, that's what... It, it takes that amount of time. But again, think about the understanding of years of harm being unstuck to do something beautiful. Again, there's this, there's this saying, and I, I'm not so, it makes me feel uncomfortable, but I still like the term. It's, uh, you may not get to enjoy the shade of the tree that you plant. Are you kidding me? I plant this tree, I don't get to enjoy the shade? You may not. Right? It's an old African proverb. You may not get to enjoy the shade of the tree that you plant. That's a phenomenal question. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. So when we're talking about creating uh, a lament, that lament needs to, it needs to change into something. So you say, I've been hurt, I've been wrong. We need to then make a monument, a flag, a song. There needs, you can have Beyonce come and do something. I don't know. But you need to do something that recognizes that there's this lament going on. So there needs to be something that's actually being done. Any other questions? Uh, it seems to me that there's a presumption behind the process, which is fairly obvious but straightforward, and that is that the parties engaged at some level want some kind of reconciliation. What advice do you have for dealing with situations which are prior to that? I mean, I live part of my life in the world of politics, and boy, do we need reconciliation there, but we don't have much in the way of willingness to even think about it. It becomes a, a war, a contest. Can you speak to, you know, we have to get beyond it, obviously, at some point. The question is, how do we? Gotcha. So I, I believe you're asking, how do we get to a starting point in reconciliation? Because, again, yeah. reconciliation yeah. is about parties wanting to be reconciled. But yeah, what happens yeah. when you've got one party that doesn't want to be reconciled? I mean, I mean I, I'm aware of the South African and the your Rwandan and other kinds of incidents where we're, People like me would be saying, oh, no way. They're not going to reconcile. And, yet, and they did. The question is, what did you see or what have you seen as how to bridge that gap? Gotcha. So that, I was literally sitting in an auditorium, and there was a guy on stage, and his name was uh, Alan Bozak. And Alan Bozak was considered to be the South African Martin Luther King Jr., who was alive, and I asked him the same question. And I thought he was going to say something so complicated that it was going to be mind-boggling. But he literally said, you go to that person and you say, as, as a heartfelt thing, I'm not going to stop engaging in this process until you sit and you speak to me, because it's that important. And I thought, well, is there more? Like, no, there's nothing more important than you hearing my voice. Now, you, you can't throw rocks and bottles. I'm not talking about that. It's like, I'm going to come to you 
in a heartfelt moment and say, I need you to hear my story. Uh, and, so, and that was his only response. It's like, is there more? No. I thought, why isn't there more? And he was like, I'm going to come to you with an open heart. And if you deny me, I'll just come back the next day and the next day until you're like, okay, stop. I'll sit down and I'll have a conversation with you. And hopefully things will change for that. Uh, I have yet to encounter true evilness. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I have yet to encounter that. But again, as it relates to reconciliation, I think coming and being forthright and open is always the way to do so. And again, if you don't want to be reconciled, then I can always do the steps within myself by myself. Right? Some people just aren't going to go that way, and that's what it is. You talked in the beginning of your presentation of your personal mission statement, and I was just wondering what the process you went through to, to create that statement and any advice you have for college students who are thinking about who they're going to become and how they might incorporate ideas about their own personal mission statements. Yeah, I, that, that's a fantastic question. Again, my mission statement is to seek out greatness while being a living contribution, and my, my key key word is great, gratitude, reconciliation, excellence, adaptation, teach, train, or technique, and it took me a very long time to do so. The first thing I had to go to, I had to go to scripture, and I started looking at it, and I was caught up with your gifts will open doors for you, right? And so whatever my gifting is, is what my gift is, and again, no one can train you in your gift. You can only refine it, right? It's been given to you, right? And so you can refine your gift. And so number one, I think you need to find out what your gift is. What are you gifted at? And then start there, like write all your gifts down and then start saying, what are the things that I think I'm being moved towards? Because I literally, I, I'm an educator, right? So I love to teach, I love to train. And so for me, I knew that teaching was it, but I also wanted to do something more than just be in a classroom. I wanted to contribute to people's lives. So step one, I think you need to start with what are your gifts? What are you gifted at? Put that in a box and then just sit on it for a while. Then when you have all your gifts, start asking yourself, how can I then apply this to real life applications? And I remember writing out like four or five different statements, but it's also gonna be small enough for you to remember, right? I, I did, it wasn't like a, a full paragraph, it's very short. Seek out greatness, become a living contribution, right? Uh, and the word great, I just put those, I mean, I, they, didn't, they wasn't started out with great. It was like, you know, gratitude and then maybe teach. And then it just kind of, it, it fell into the word great when I put it together, but it didn't start out with great. It started out with multiple words, but I started out with what my gifting is. What are you gifted at? Set it aside, take some time, pray over it, and then start saying, what does all this mean? And then, then just write it out and just keep writing it out and writing it out. It took me about a good six months to actually have my mission statement and my core values. And again, here's the thing about my mission statement and my core values. Am I hitting it 90, 100% every single day? No. Some days I'm like, yeah, 100. Other days I'm like, ooh, negative 100. I'm not doing so well. But I have a starting point that I can go to. I have got this thing that I'm working through. Other questions? So when talking about establishing like an authentic relationship, how do you establish an authentic relationship with someone who's hurt you without opening the door for them to hurt you again? That's a great, again, we first need to work on forgiveness, which again is, is a very difficult thing to do. It's how am I going to trust you again? And, and so then how do, we, how do you build trust through forgiveness? And again, forgiveness isn't about forgetting. It's about putting something else on top of that thing because if it's just, ah, uh, just forget about it. Uh, I'll forget about it for a couple of days. Then you might say something that reminds me of the, what you said. There's, ah, I don't forgive you. I take it back. 
Now, so I got to put something on top of that thing. I need to, again, I need to let that go because if not, I'm going to keep going back to it over and over again. And so again, it isn't, it, and again, it doesn't happen overnight. I'm not saying, oh, forgive him, and then the next day, like, oh, you're forgiven, I love you. No, it might take some time and some energy, but you got to put something on top of it because it isn't that you're not going to forget what happened. You need to put something on top that says something that's on here so that I'll, I'll remember the top thing before I get to the bottom. You just keep adding more layers until you're thinking, okay, I can then literally trust you again. But again, reconciliation doesn't mean that you're off the hook. Right? I know some couples that have gotten divorced because one of the two couples did something uh, that was unspeakable and they got a divorce because of it, but they're still reconciled. But again, I can't trust you to not do that again or whatever. And so again, it isn't that there aren't natural consequences to the things in which we do. It's just that I've forgiven you for what you've done. And it's a difficult task to do. I, 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 I completely understand what you're, what you're getting at. But where are you seeing hope through reconciliation? Where do I see? Well, I see hope and reconciliation when I see uh, the mother forgive the young man who shot and killed her son. I see uh, hope as we have more and more people who are engaging in the process of reconciliation. Uh, I see hope as it relates to uh, cities uh, creating a truth. That I, so I, I live in uh, St. Paul and I work in Minneapolis and the city of Minneapolis has created a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So this is Minneapolis, right? And so Minneapolis has decided to give power and authority to a group of people who work for the city and also community members to decide on what's going to happen. So I sit on that board, but I, I find real hope in those types of things. And so again, uh, I have hope that with reconciliation uh, that we will have, uh, you know, a better tomorrow. So I am very hopeful. Without, without reconciliation, I wouldn't be very hopeful uh, in, my pers in my city where, I, where I'm at. I think we had a question here and then one in the back. To follow up on that. Okay. So let's talk specifically about what's happening in Minneapolis. Okay. Um, and the commission that you're sitting on. Are you seeing progress and how is that going? Yeah. So the, the very first thing that we needed to do was we needed to, to figure out definitions because uh, one of the very first things that was talked about was I'm not going to be engaging in reconciliation that doesn't have anything to do with justice. That was the very first thing that we had someone say who was uh, a, a, an indigenous uh, Native American that said, hang on for a second, We've our, we, we get where this is going. This is a bunch of more talking and not a lot of justice. So we needed to define what it meant to be about reconciliation. And we've gotten through that. And I think how we're defining reconciliation uh, is very robust. Uh, there's a lot of hope there. But again, yes, I think that you first need to define what you're trying to get at. So we are, we are seeing progress in, in, in South Minneapolis as it relates to uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I'm a United Methodist pastor in this community. Uh, yes. So over the years of my ministry, I've, I know that there's been several times, including here in the conference, here in the Dakotas, that we've had a service of reconciliation. Um, and thinking about that now with, with the framework that you've talked, it's like, okay, we've, we've sometimes done the words and said the things, and maybe that makes us feel good, but what have we done to establish authentic community to really hear? And I heard you just starting to address that a little bit. Uh, and it, that just kind of strikes me that sometimes we do things to make us feel good, but it's not really reconciliation. Yes, I completely agree. Uh, so <laughs> reconciliation includes, let's say me and you are at Discord and we keep coming together doing reconciliation and then afterwards you say 
man, I feel so awesome about what we're going through in this process. And someone's like, Sean, how's it going? I'm like, this sucks. This is horrible. Then we're not doing reconciliation. Because either A, you're not recognizing what you're doing, or B, I'm not recognizing what I'm doing. But you can't be in a relationship with someone, and one's like, this is awesome. And I'm like, this sucks. And, and so I think what we, when we do things like that, we're not actually being reconciled with other individuals. And I can only speak for myself as it relates to being in Minnesota. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, it isn't about reconciliation. It's about something else. Because if it was about reconciliation, then I would feel it and I would know it was happening to me. And what happens is that we do these things and I'm still like, yeah, I'm, I, I don't buy it. Thank you. Yeah. Both of us have to buy it. We both have to agree, agree with the ingredients. We both have to like the pie. If someone doesn't like the pie, then you've got to scratch it and do something else. Just so you know, Heike is from South Africa. So here's. OK, so um, my question is, so that we obviously know in South Africa that there needs to be a lot of reconciliation because of what happened in the past and stuff. But how do you? make the first step with reconciling with people in our generation, like how do we reconcile with each other if what happened is not one of our faults, but that's part of our reality today? Gotcha. So I, I think what I hear you saying is, how can, I be recon how can I be held to something that I did not do, but it's still a real life impactful thing in my reality? And I think that goes both ways. So uh, as it relates to I didn't do it, so why do I have to deal with it? And then other people could say, well, I wasn't back then, but I still have to deal with it. Right? And so if, if one side has to deal with what didn't someone do, then you both have to deal with that particular thing. And, and so again, it's, it's the idea of someone saying, well, I didn't do that. I didn't own any slaves, and I wasn't back there during that time. And, that's, uh, and that's, that's, that's fine. But then someone was like, well, I wasn't a slave back then, but I'm still dealing with the ramifications of slavery. Well, then, you, then you have to still deal with that thing in a most appropriate way. Because, again, if someone's like, I didn't do it, I'm not going to deal with it. And the other one's like, well, I'm still dealing with it. Then you don't get to reconciliation. And, again, as I'm talking about reconciliation, we're talking about a partnership in dealing with the issues that are taking place. If anyone's like, I don't want to deal with that, well, then you can't actually do reconciliation. And who's to blame for this issue that takes place? And this is, I, I was asked this question about systemic issues, like how do we deal, so it's easy for me to deal with individual things, either I'm doing it or I'm not. But if it's a system thing and I'm not a part of that system, then how do I deal with it? And the only thing that I can say is, how did Christ deal with the system of, of, of sin? How did he take that on? And again, as Christians, we are called to be bigger than those around us. And so even though I did not do it, I am still held responsible to deal with it with others. And I think this is probably one of the number one problems with the church in America, that the church in America doesn't want to actually want to deal with some of the issues that have taken place in the past. Uh, again, uh, the church, I hold the church at a high level uh, of it being neglectful as it relates to American racism. Because you can literally say that there are people around that had no clue but if you're in the church and you don't have a clue, then that's a problem for me in particular. But that's just me. It's my theological slant. I think of the biblical principle of community repentance, too. Yeah, that there, there's a, definitely a, a biblical principle there of, of repenting as a community. Yes. And was that Liz? Did you have... Yeah, thank you for this. It's been really helpful. And I, I will say one of the things that help me is to realize that even though I might not have done that, I have benefited. And whether I chose to benefit or not, um, you, may, you may have been harmed. You didn't choose to be harmed. I, I didn't harm you, but I've benefited for centuries of just by my race. And, and that got me to personally to a little different place. Um, 
my question for you is if, as I've come to this newer understanding, and I will tell you through this summer and through all these things, um, I realize that I have been a part of that system more than I realize now. I'm always fighting for feminism and all that stuff. So I, you know, that little minuscule. And I said to somebody, look, I don't really see color. And the response to me was, because you haven't had to. And, you know, if you're a Euro male, you know, you haven't seen sexism because you haven't had to. So now that we're all, I hope, evolving a bit to this, on an individual level, when I try to start those relationships, I don't know if I don't like you or not. I don't know you, right? So when I first start that relationship, is there a way for me to acknowledge that without making it a obstacle or a barrier to my relationship with you? I think so. So uh, Alan, when he was asking me, I, I've been here for most of the afternoon, and we've had lunch and dinner, and we were talking about, uh, so I'm a classically trained anthropologist. Oh, ho, 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 right? So uh, I've been classically trained, but before, before all that schooly, schooly, big head stuff, I was an anthropologist in my own neighborhood, right? So I grew up in South Minneapolis. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of money. We were, I would say we were objectively poor. Uh, but I just remember growing up being very curious about other individuals uh, and riding the bus and sitting next to other individuals. I just sit next to them and go, hi, I'm Sean, what's your name? And they look at me, who's this crazy kid sitting next to me? But again, it's the idea of, literally, I mean, number one, if you come to me with your heart open and you say, I want to build a relationship with you, I don't understand a great deal of this, I'm going to fumble, I'm going to make mistakes, but I truly want to, to grow to know who you are, you got to be a real life a-hole to be like, yeah, no, kick rocks, sucker, get out. Right, you got but I, but I wouldn't. I would be like, oh, let's let's get into this relationship. Again, I think we we become fearful of being told, no, I don't want you to be in a relationship. And again, you you need to be mindful of who you want to be in a relationship with. Right, you you find someone who's gotten jacked by the system, and they're just getting out of a really bad situation. Hey, hey, it's me. Hey, I want to be your friend. I want to hug you. That's not going to work. Hey, eh. Again, there's, there's timing. But I think that we don't spend more time actually being more compassionate about what we don't know. And, and, and as, an anthro, as an anthropologist, I'm constantly like, hey, I don't know, but I want to know, and I want you to be my teacher. I'm like, okay, let me teach them. Like, okay, great, let's, let's learn. Because then I get to learn that way. And then again, it's, it's cool being the student engaging in the three F's and, or the philosophies of something else. Because once I understand, I'm like, oh, yeah, I get that. Yeah, you betcha. But I don't say you betcha. <laughs> but it makes complete sense for me to want to be a student. And I think being a student is a cool thing. I grew up being a student, and now that I'm a classically trained anthropologist, doctor, da, da, da. I get to say, hey, you know what? I, 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 I don't know, but I want to know. And I want you to be the one who teaches me. And what an honor to have someone say, I will teach you. And then you go to someone else and say, hey, I want to learn something else. Again, we need to take up on the spirit of being more teachable. More teachable, more open, more compassionate. Yeah. Any other questions? So is that it? Any, I don't see any hands. Okay, let's give Sean a round of applause and say thank you for coming, for being our Stark Lecturer this year. Sean, we've needed, we've needed this encouraging talk and we appreciate your uh, moving us toward a greater uh, cohesiveness and communal um, uh, reconciliation. So thank you so much for coming and being our Stark Lecture this year. You're welcome. I do have a question for all of you. And my question is quite simply this. What will you take with you that I said 
and begin to apply this in your life where you are. That's, I mean, it's more of a challenge. Uh, it, it's, it's my gift to you. If you want the notes, I can bring you the notes. I can give Alan a PowerPoint presentation of how you do the process. Uh, but it's, it's, it's for you. It's, it's, this is yours. Again, I, I can't claim the gospel as mine, right? I could, but it would be really like foolish to do so. I'd, I'd be held accountable to that one on the other end, I think. But I, I want you to be challenged on what will you take with you and apply to your, to your lives. And with that, I say good night and blessings upon all of you.